Thank you. It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, just want to begin to, uh, by uh, welcoming everyone uh, back to the Legislature, and uh, with the exception of the tribute to, uh, to Joseph Ning. Uh, feels like deja vu all over again, Mr. Speaker. They're there, and we're here. <laughs> Premier. <laughs> I teed that up for you. <laughs> Premier Ed Clark uh, made it clear that his report had only the conclusions that you wanted when he stated, and I quote, you can only do it by sitting down with the Premier and saying, if you're going to ask me to do something, why don't you have me do something that you actually want? Now, Premier, because you didn't allow Mr. Clark to have all of the options on the table right from the get-go, mm -hmm. a number of people, including myself, think that what you really wanted was an excuse, a report that would allow you to bring in new revenue tools that will raise the cost of alcohol, beer, and hydro, just to name a few. Question. Uh, with the uh, <clears throat> added threat of people losing their jobs as you squeeze uh, these assets. So I ask you today, are people going to lose their jobs? How many people are going to lose their Thank jobs? Thank you. Is the price of beer going to go up? Is alcohol going to go up? Or hydro? Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and I want to, uh, I want to join my uh, voice with uh, the um, leader of the opposition to welcome everyone back. I know that everyone has worked very hard in their constituencies uh, over the period of time that uh, that the legislature wasn't sitting, and so uh, welcome back here. There is a lot of work to do, and uh, I'm very pleased that we are all back here to do it. And as as the leader of the opposition knows. Uh, we ran on a plan to build the province up. We ran on a plan to make investments in the people, in the infrastructure, in the business of this, businesses of this province, and that's what we're going to do. And part of that was we said we were going to ask Ed Clark and his uh, his group, the council that uh, included Janet Ecker and Answer. Francis Lankin, ask him to give us some advice on assets, and that's exactly what we've done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, to go back to the Premier, it's clear that Ed Clark's recommendations won't solve the significant financial problems that you've brought, uh, uh, brought to this province, $11 billion deficit, which is more than all the other provinces and the federal government combined. I think my colleague from Wellington Halton Hill said it right when he, he said, uh, uh, it's clear that you've learned nothing from previous tobaccos. You couldn't run a hot dog stand. Um, Premier, will you do what we have asked? And to make sure you get it right this time, because your track record with Orange and the gas plants is abys abysmal and scandalous, and ask the Auditor General to review every public asset sale before you move forward and to ensure that taxpayers are getting the best deal. Order. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I actually believe that what we have asked Ed Clark and his council to do is a perfect example of learning from the past. Yeah. Because if we think about the way the member opposite's party, when they were in office, dealt with the 407, Mr. Speaker. I mean, there could not be a more blatant example of a thoughtless, unplanned, and, uh, uh, and a, an absolutely bad deal for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So we have learned. We have learned that this this view and um, review of assets has to be done in a thoughtful way, Mr. Speaker. It has to be done in a way that maximizes and optimizes the assets that we have in this province and then allows us, Mr. Speaker, to make the investments that we know we need in assets for the future, like transportation infrastructure. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I'm uh, going to make this comment once and then move on to uh, a more aggressive way to uh, bring civility here. Uh, when, when the Premier is answering, or anyone on that side is answering, if I hear heckling from that side, I'm going to cut the answer short. And the same goes on this side. And now I'll move into individuals. Final supplementary, please. <clears throat> Premier, since you've taken office, you've talked a lot about transparency and accountability, but your actions don't match up with the rhetoric. Your new uh, Liberal member from Trinity Spadina told us recently in committee that he believes in supporting openness and transparency, but only, quote, at the right time. That's pretty consistent with what we've seen from you thus far. 
However, you have stated that had various precautions been taken in the past, the glass, gas plant scandal would never have happened. So we're asking you to take those precautions today and let the Auditor General do her job and look into every public asset sale before you close the deal. Why won't you agree with that? We all agree with the Auditor Question. General and the impartiality there, the expertise there. It's the right way to go. Just say yes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, well, you know, I I know that uh, I know that the Auditor General will choose uh, the areas that she, uh, that she wants to uh, look at, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, I'm confident that as we move forward, as I say, on a a review of uh, and. Uh, action on optimizing the assets that belong to the people of Ontario we are going to we are going to be able to realize real new benefit from those assets mr speaker and in fact the uh, the council was asked to look at maximizing the value of hydro one opg and lcbo to generate a better return mr speaker to provide a benefit to customers and to provide the opportunity for us to invest in transit and tra transportation infrastructure so ed clark who has led that review made a speech last week mr speaker Answer. we will be looking forward to his interim report and all of that information will be available to the people of Ontario, including the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, Leader of the Opposition. Back to the uh, Premier, Speaker. Clearly, Premier, you don't want to be uh, accountable and transparent on that file, so let me try another one. Whoa. We strongly believe that it's the duty of those of us that are fortunate enough to be elected to this place uh, on behalf of the public to maintain transparency and accountability and openness. You've talked about it a lot. But how can you reconcile that promise that you make so often, Premier, to be open and accountable when you've instructed your government committee members to hide financial information about your $309 million Mars bailout? Why won't you be open and transparent and provide the documents we're asking for? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just let me just uh, go over a little bit of background on uh, because I know that the uh, member opposite wants he wants as we do for there to be the best innovation and research in Ontario possible. He wants as we do we do, Mr. Speaker, that startup companies have the support that they need. So we know, Mr. Speaker, that Mars is a world-renowned center of research and innovation, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, it's a, an organization that has generated economic activity of about $3 billion has helped or advised 1,400 companies, Mr. Speaker, to get started and to, uh, to be able to uh, expand. Um, our priority has been, and it will continue to be, to protect Ontario's investment in that building, Mr. Speaker. We fully expect Answer. that the $224 million loan will be paid back in full. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are we are operating on that assumption and supporting there. Mars in their innovation and research. <laughs> Premier, uh, we all know what Mars is intended to do. Uh, it's a great objective. Our government was involved in starting phase one, which, uh, which by the way, we, we built uh, knowing that we could fill the building. Uh, you went on. You knew fully. There were lots of media reports. You knew fully when you went on to, to uh, phase two that that building may very well be empty. Then you involved a private developer, uh, Alexander Real Estate, uh, and then you changed the rules uh, at Infrastructure Ontario. All of this without any transparency, without any light shining in at all from the Auditor General, without reporting to this House. So you owe us, you owe the taxpayers, an explanation of what you're up to, and the best explanation is Question. to show us the documents we want. We want the agreement between your government and Alexandra Real Estate, and we want the details around the Infrastructure Ontario loan, <laughs> which you. at the very least should be public. Maybe Thank Mr. Speaker, the, the, um, the member opposite knows that this building has been repeatedly valued at or above the amount that we've invested, That's Mr. Right. Speaker. I think that the, op the member opposite also knows that, that it would be reckless, Mr. Speaker, and it would jeopardize a, 
would jeopardize a conditional agreement, Mr. Speaker, to make certain confidential documents public before, before that, uh, that deal, that arrangement, had been completed. So I'm not going to. We're not going to undermine uh, an arrangement that would be in the best interest of the people of Ontario by providing information publicly that needs to be confidential for a period of time. We are committed to being open and transparent, and I want information to be available to the public and obviously to the members of the opposition as they ask for it, Answer. but not at the risk to the benefit of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to undermine those commercially sensitive transactions. Final supplementary. You know, it clearly is to the Premier again. It clearly is deja vu all over again. You obviously haven't learned anything from Orange or eHealth or gas plants. You don't know. You're continuing your propensity as Liberals to just throw more money after bad. Minister uh, of Economic no Development, too, which was clear around here that you shouldn't have gone ahead and developed. You went ahead yeah. using the taxpayers' money because you don't care about the taxpayers' money. Same thing you did in Orange, same thing you did with gas plants, same thing you did at eHealth, just throw hundreds of millions out the door and you refuse to be accountable and transparent for that. Don't repeat the mistakes of the past. You've got two police probes going on now because of those mistakes in the past. Let's not have to call for another one. Give us the documents we want. Premier. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, the Minister responsible for infrastructure is reviewing the documents. We will release those documents responsibly, Mr. Speaker. But as I said, we will not undermine the best interests of the people of Ontario by releasing commercially sensitive documents when there is a process underway, Mr. Speaker. We will not do that because we know that Mars is and is going to continue to be a success. And I would, I would say to the member opposite that he should be careful as he undermines the, the rhetoric around the future of Mars, Mr. Speaker, because the fact is— Order. Order. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, because he knows full well that there is expertise, there is innovation potential in this province. He knows full well that Mars has been Member successful and will continue to be successful. And part of that is making sure that that building is functioning at the highest, highest capacity. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Why does the Premier think it's better to have Ontario's local hydro companies in the hands of private for-profit speculators rather than in the hands of Ontarians themselves? <laughs> Open <mind>. well, <laughs> and again, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I welcome the members of the third party uh, back. I know that uh, they've been working hard in their constituencies. And what the, uh, what the leader of the third party is asking about, Mr. Speaker, is the practical and sensible plan that we are moving forward with to make sure that the assets of this province that are owned by the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, that they work to the very best advantage of the people of Ontario. That's the work that Ed Clark is doing with his council, Mr. Speaker, and he has said quite clearly he doesn't believe that selling those assets is the right answer. He has said that. So the, uh, I, I believe that the leader of the third party is probably having a bit of a hard time framing the question because, in fact, Ed Clark has said that he agrees that selling those assets is not the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, well, Speaker, last week Ed Clark released his interim plan for our shared public assets at a private business luncheon. He released a plan for alcohol sales that he knew would get a lot of ink and tried to bury a plan to privatize hydro utilities. Now, if this was this Premier's intention, why did she not campaign on Harris-style hydro privatization? Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the assumptions about um, optimizing the value of uh, Ontario's assets was part of our plan, Mr. Speaker. We campaigned on it, yeah. and so did she, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The leader of the third party campaigned on exactly the same fiscal assumptions that uh, that we campaigned on, Mr. Speaker, and she knows full well. 
that having asked Ed Clark to do his work, he is going to deliver an interim report. Mr. Speaker. She also knows full well that he has said he agrees that selling off those assets is not the right thing to do. He's also said that there are changes that can be made that will benefit the customers, Mr. Speaker, will benefit the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, and will also provide the best benefit to the people of Ontario because we will be able to then invest in transportation infrastructure that is much needed across this province. Well, Speaker, on Friday, Ed Clark told Ontarians that he wanted public hydro companies to, quote, bring in private capital so, quote, Ontario could sell down some of its interests. The Premier wants to bring private speculators into local hydro utilities. Then she wants to sell them off. Ontarians are going to be left paying for the cost of hydro and the profits of private energy speculators. Now, when you privatize a public company, I call that privatizing. Yeah. And when you sell off public ownership, I call that a sell-off. What does the Premier call it, Speaker, and why didn't she call it like it is during the election campaign? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I was quite clear. We were quite clear during the election, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to look at the assets of the people of this province, Mr. Speaker, and we were going to make sure that they were working at optimal capacity to provide for the opportunity for us to invest in new assets that are needed by the people of Ontario, transportation infrastructure. What the leader of the third party is saying, Mr. Speaker, is that she would never change anything, yep. ever. That she would not take a responsible and sensible look at assets that were, that were purchased many years ago, Mr. Speaker, and find a way to make sure that they could work better. She would never do that. She would never take that responsible step. I believe that that does not serve the people of Ontario, would not serve the people of Ontario. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that there is a way to make change that actually benefits the future of the province. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My second question is uh, for the Premier. The Premier is starting to behave as though Ontario's uh, hydro system belongs to the Liberal Party of Ontario. Our public hydro companies belong to Ontarians, Speaker. The Premier is plunging headlong into a Mike Harris hydro privatization scheme. She hid this plan from Ontarians during the election. Will she now come forward and commit? to stopping and asking Ontarians first for their approval before she sells off their assets. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, education come to order. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'm I'm laughing because uh, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change is is replaying the attacks that were coming at us from the uh, the third party before the election, Mr. Right. Speaker, because we were talking about doing this very thing that we were going to look at the assets. And if I if I read you from the uh, the text of the 2014 budget that was introduced in May, but you didn't. Read the government will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as Crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, yeah. Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board right of Ontario. There. It was right there, Mr. Speaker. That's what we ran on. That's what we brought to the people of Ontario. And in fact, the assumptions in the Answer. budget were what she ran on as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, one of the things I think is clear is that was part of the Trojan horse budget that New Democrats did not support, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, Manitoba, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Order. <laughs> the member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to order. Minister of the Environment, come to the order. Proceed, please. Manitoba and Saskatchewan, uh, Speaker, are two provinces that actually have protections built in for their public assets. Will the Premier support New Democrats' call for a referendum on the sale of any of our crown jewels, or will she keep tight-lipped as she was during the election campaign regarding these schemes? 
So, Mr. Speaker, again, I will just refer the uh, the leader of the third party to the uh, text of our uh, our plan that we ran on. Our Moving Ontario Forward plan includes a balanced and responsible approach to paying for the investments. So, the, the, those are the investments in uh, transportation infrastructure. The funds will be de be from dedicated sources of revenue, including asset optimization of $3.15 billion, or 10.9 per cent. So, Mr. We Speaker, we ran on this. We said that okay. there are assets in the uh, province of Ontario that need to be reviewed, that we need to make sure are working in the best interests of the people of Ontario, including, including the opportunities to find a better rate for uh, the people of Ontario it, when it comes to hydro, Mr. Speaker, to find ways to bring costs down to the people of Ontario, and to make sure that we have the uh, we have the funds necessary to invest in transportation infrastructure, including Thank transit, you. which the leader of the third party says she supports, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. The public hydro system belongs to Ontarians, but the Premier's advisor is calling for, quote, bringing in private capital so that the province can, quote, sell down its interests. Ed Clark wants to, quote, dilute the government interest and wants public hydro utilities to seek out their own new partners, public or private. Now, is the Premier going to privatize and sell off public assets without the approval of the Ontarians who actually own these assets, or will she do the right thing by the people of this province and give them their say on these schemes? Thank you for your very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I, I believe that there is a a role for the private sector, and I, I think you know the uh, leader of the third party might want to ask her predecessors. Um, when the NDP government signed nine private uh, power generating oh. contracts, whether whether that was consistent with what uh, with what she's saying now, Mr. Speaker, we will be responsible. We have, we have said that we believe that these assets need to be in the hands of the people of Ontario. Ed Clark has agreed with that, Mr. Speaker, and we will move responsibly to make sure that these assets work for the people of Ontario because we believe that we can recycle, Mr. Speaker, some of those funds and invest them in transportation infrastructure, that that is the responsible Answer. and sensible thing to do. Thank you. Your question, the from the PM Welcome back. Premier, my question is for you. Uh, Premier, you're proposing to eliminate 140,000 daycare spaces, childcare spaces, throughout the entire province of Ontario. My question is, why do you want to make it more difficult for Ontario parents like me, who are trying to find affordable and accessible childcare uh, and, and that is close to their homes? Can you answer that question for us? Minister of Education. Education. Yes, I, I'm a little bit confused by the nature of the question because I have absolutely no plan to eliminate childcare spaces. Now, the only way I can figure out that the member opposite might have reached this conclusion is if we eliminate illegal. Uh, child care spaces because what we're certainly doing, Speaker, is uh, we have created a dedicated enforcement unit to look at uh, unlicensed home child care spaces. When we, are, when we receive a complaint, we respond to that complaint very quickly. Uh, we have actually got a new uh, bill before the House, which uh, of course died on the order paper, Answer. but which we reintroduced. And I'll be very pleased in the supplementary to talk about some of the steps that we're taking in that child care Thank modernization you. Act. Thank you, Speaker. It doesn't surprise me that the minister is confused uh, by the question, but I can tell you, certainly having, sp having spoken with other parents across this province, this is a very real issue for them Deputy across House this Leader, province. You are about to cut 140,000 childcare spaces in this province, and you have no plan. As a parent, I ask you, why do you think you are better suited than me to make a childcare decision for my child and every other child in this province? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So if you actually look at the Child Care Modernization Act, what you will find is that for those people who are licensed home child care providers, they will actually be able to increase the number of children that they serve. They will be allowed under the new legislation, which we hope we will have cooperation in passing, uh, but we will find in the new legislation that we are increasing the number of children from five to six. However, we also believe that to ensure the safety of children, that we should be asking unlicensed providers to follow the same rules that licensed home care providers already include, which is to count their own children yes, in the count of the children being cared for. But what we've also done in the legislature is put new enforcement tools Thank there you. so that when people break the law, Thank you. Your question, the member from Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Good morning, Minister. Thank you for reaching out to the friends of the Duff Bob E. Mansion when you're in Windsor. Thank you to the caucus for being in Windsor and Ms. Gretzky's riding of Windsor West and spending some money last weekend. Speaker, one of the truly disturbing aspects of this growing bar scandal is this government's unwillingness to disclose crucial information that would shed some light on this $400 million fiasco. For example, Speaker, it refuses to tell us why, in 2010, it had to write a new regulation specifically to allow Mars to be eligible for an Infrastructure Ontario loan. And, Speaker, it refuses to release the details of that loan agreement. Minister, will this government finally release this crucial information? Be transparent. Will you shed some light on Question. it? Pull up the blinds, if you will, on this shady deal. Thank you, the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me begin by, uh, by saying that uh, all of my colleagues uh, had a fantastic time in Windsor. Our, uh, our meeting there went fantastic. Our party's really supercharged about being back here today. And the good people of Windsor, Mr. Speaker, we have every confidence, Mr. Speaker, that we will continue to work hard with them to continue to build a strong economy in Windsor. And certainly we look forward to the members' advice going forward. It's a great part of our province. We are really proud to have been there on the weekend. I know each and every one of my colleagues do. Secondly, the member knows we've spent 10 hours together over the last two weeks in Estimates Committee, and I've said many, many times that we will share all documents and information, Mr. Speaker, and we have been doing that. But, Mr. Speaker, I think the member knows full well Answer. that, that uh, I have to take advice from my deputy in terms of documents that may be commercially sensitive. If I were not to do that, I'd be abdicating my responsibility as a minister, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I, surely the member wouldn't want me to do that. To supplementary, the member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Quite frankly, I don't think I'm the only one for whom writing a new regulation just to allow Mars to qualify for a $224 million loan sets off alarm bells. I mean, this wasn't the regulation to expand eligibility of the I.O. loan program to a broader range of nonprofits and charities. This was a secondary regulation that was designed to allow Mars to pocket a $224 million loan that they were in no position to repay. Will this government admit that for the past four years it has covered up the fact that it passed a regulation in secret that allowed Mars to qualify for a $224 million loan that this government knew Mars was in no position to repay to the taxpayers of Ontario? It's ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. It is, it is impossible for this government to pass a regulation in secret. All regulations are absolutely public, Mr. Speaker. They're posted in public. They're circulated in public for a period of time, even before they're passed. So, Mr. Speaker, that that uh, that suggestion is, is beyond ridiculous. But, Mr. Speaker, let me say this. I will continue to release whatever information that we have, Mr. Speaker, on, on this and other issues. This government will continue to be open and transparent. But, Mr. Speaker, if the member is asking us to release information that's commercially sensitive, Mr. Speaker, that would be abdicating my responsibility as a minister to go against the advice of my deputy minister to do that. That would also be abdicating our 
our responsibility to the public, Mr. Speaker, and the, and the commercial reputation of this province, which would do us Answer. great damage. That would simply not be a responsible thing to do. We will be open and transparent. We have been. We'll continue to be. We'll release whatever documents we can, Mr. Speaker, and we'll do it as quickly. New question, the member from Davenport. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. From canvassing door to door during the spring election to receiving calls coming into my constituency office, the economy is top of mind to residents of Davenport. Over the summer, I have seen many reports that are saying Ontario's economy is on the right track and that our economic plan is working. To quote CIBC's report released in September, Ontario has seen a notable resurgence. Last week, BMO released a very similar report predicting strong growth in Ontario. This is great news for my riding of Davenport and the rest of the province. Would the minister please inform the House about last month's job numbers and how our province has grown since the last global recession? Minister. Well, that's a terrific question. I'm delighted to do that. And uh, you know, we have to be careful as we use month-to-month -month job numbers. They do fluctuate, but Mr. Speaker, what they do is they indicate a trend. And I'm really happy to be able to get up on my feet today in this legislature and say, for the first time since the global recession, Mr. Speaker, we are now up over half a million net new jobs recovered since the recession. Up half a million jobs. 514,300 to be exact since June 2009. Mr. Speaker, if you compare us to the U.S., we're up over 190 percent in jobs since the global recession. In the U.S., they're about 120 percent, Mr. Speaker, or just a little bit above that. What that tells me, Mr. Speaker, is that our plan to invest in our people, our plan to invest in infrastructure, our plan to build a, a good, healthy environment, yes, a good, healthy business climate is working, Mr. Speaker. We've yes. come a long way. We still have further to go. And, Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep creating jobs in this province. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is great news for my constituents and all Ontarians. Our government should be very proud of this growth. As many of us must hear, people in Davenport are concerned about youth, uh, youth employment. I know that our government has introduced many programs and initiatives to help youth enter and succeed in our province's job market. The youth job strategy that was introduced in the 2013 budget has shown real success. Would the minister please update the House on our success to combat youth employment. Thank you, Minister. Look, Mr. Speaker, first and foremost, we all think, believe, and understand that youth unemployment is still too high. Mr. Speaker, it's almost double the unemployment rate for the rest of us. That's unacceptable. And that's why the Premier moved forward with our, our youth job strategy uh, some time ago. Now it's been about a year that it's been in place. And already, Mr. Speaker, over 20,000 jobs have been created. Job opportunities, Mr. Speaker, have been created for young people across this province. That's really important, Mr. Speaker. Last month alone, 12,600 young people found employment in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, that was a fantastic month for youth, but we have a lot of work to keep doing. We're going to keep investing, Mr. Speaker, in creating job opportunities for our young people. We're going to keep investing in our youth job strategy, Mr. Speaker, which is providing yes, opportunities sir. for young people to find employment. We're determined to continue to bring down youth unemployment. We've made great gains to date. We've got more work to do, and Thank we're looking you. forward to continuing that good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I'd like to share with you a few headlines that I thought you might enjoy. The Globe and Mail, September 22nd. Premier win to reveal cabinet plans in bid to boost transparency. CBC News, September 25th. Ontario Premier promises more transparency. Releases mandate letter for ministers. Premier, those headlines were less than a month ago, but so much has changed. Here's a few newer headlines. Toronto Star, October 14th. Liberal MPPs block release of Mars financial details. CBC News, October 15th. Liberals won't release details of Mars office tower deal. Premier. Your member from Trinity Spadina told the committee quite clearly that he believes in openness and transparency at the right time. So, Premier, I ask you, do you agree with Mr. Dong's statement? Thank you. And if so, thank you.
I remind, remind this member and all members, when I stand, you sit. Premier. Economic development, employment and infrastructure. Mr. Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm really proud to be part of a the government from with the Premier. member from Leeds is warned. With the Premier, Mr. Speaker, who is absolutely committed to ensuring that as we do business in this province, we do it in a very straightforward, transparent uh, way, Mr. Speaker. And that's very, very important to each and every one of our ministers. But, Mr. Speaker, if the member is asking this government to put out documents that our deputy minister and our legal folks in the ministry are telling us is commercially sensitive, does he really think it would be responsible for us to do that? Because, Mr. Speaker, that, frankly, would be abdicating my responsibility as a minister if I were to supersede that advice and release those documents. What I will do, Mr. Speaker, is what we've committed to do a number of times in the last couple of weeks, and that's to release all documents, Mr. Speaker, that, that exist. Uh, that are, are not commercially Answer. sensitive, and Mr. Speaker, with the documents that may be commercially sensitive, we'll ask our ministry, and I have asked our ministry, to release what they can of Thank those you. documents. I think that's pretty fair. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Premier, your minister was less than forthright. Our requesting committee were very simple and very straightforward. We asked for the original loan agreement between the government and Mars, as well as the original business plan Mars used to justify the loan. Our final request was for the contract between ARE and Mars, which the government has bailed out for $65 million. We offered that the committee would to go in camera to protect any commercially sensitive information. Premier, we went, we offered to go in camera to protect those, that information. Premier, members of your government and committee voted against each and every motion. Each vote was a clear vote against openness and transparency. Premier, when will you stay Question. true to your words and will you table these documents to the Estimates Committee? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, the members' inaccurate, misinformed, over the top, silly rhetoric aside, Yes, Mr. Speaker, we will table documents to the Estimates Committee. What we will have to do, Mr. Speaker, is make sure those documents and the information we provide is, 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 is not commercially sensitive, Mr. Speaker. That's our responsibility as, as my responsibility as a minister. It's order. our responsibility as a government to ensure that we're serving the public interest. I know, Mr. Speaker, the member understands that. I know as an opposition member what he's trying to do here. But, Mr. Speaker, I will not abdicate my responsibility as a minister to serve the public interest. I simply will not do that. I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do. I don't even think that's an appropriate request. But we will provide whatever information the committee's requested, provide it's not commercially sensitive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I believe that all low-paid PSW should receive the promised raise increase for all of the hours that they work. But under the Liberal Treasury Force budget, the PSW who pays clients gets the raise but those who feed them don't. Those who work in community mental health don't. And most PSW don't see the wage applies to their travel time from clients to clients. For all of these PSW, this liberal promise is a broken promise. Why did the minister choose to leave so many of those low-paid PSW behind? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's great to be back, and I appreciate the question as well because it gives me the opportunity to, well, first of all, acknowledge the tremendous critical work that our PSWs That's are doing sure. right across this province and in, in a number of venues, and certainly no more important than in our home care setting, Mr. Speaker. And I know that many Ontarians, particularly our seniors, but those with complex needs, rely on our PSWs for their support. That's why I am so, pr so proud, Mr. Speaker, to be part of a government that has made a commitment to our PSWs who, quite frankly, are not adequately compensated, where yep. we've committed to increasing their wages by $4 an hour, Mr. Yep. Speaker, over the next three years. And, 
of order. Of again. course, the party opposite, the third party, did not support yes, those sir. measures no. that we took, and I'm happy to talk about other measures beyond the wage increase that we're committed to as a government in the supplementary. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, New Democrats will continue to push for good living wages for all of the PSW because right now there are so many of them that are falling through the big holes left behind in this Liberal promise. The minister has the opportunity to fix our home care system, but today it is as broken as ever and getting even more fragmented. Now, PSW still don't know how many hours they have if they will work next week, they're still being paid different wages for work of equal value, and many PSW do not get the wage increases for the time spent traveling. We're talking home care. They all have to travel. Why doesn't the minister take this opportunity to fix Question. rather than uh, continue with this broken model for low-paid but vital health care workers? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I have great respect for the member opposite, uh, but on this issue, I have to say that the NDP party has no authority to speak, yeah. that's and that's right. because it wasn't in your platform. No. It was in our budget, the budget that you voted against. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing the wages of our PSWs by $4. We're also taking a number of important measures to increase and guarantee the, sustainable, the sustainability Mr. Speaker, of this important aspect of our health care system. Mr. Speaker, we've added three million additional PSW hours in this Three province. We've added, Mr. Speaker, 2,500 new PSWs in our long-term care homes alone in the last five years. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that this gave me the opportunity to, to raise the important measures that we're taking, but I'm not going to take lessons from the NDP party when it comes to our PSWs. Yes, we're working hard. We're seeing that progress. Thank you. New question, the member from the Minnesota well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, the people of this province are interested and excited about the government's local food strategy. More consumption of local food is better for our health and support of our local agricultural community and economy. In my riding in Northumberland, Queenie West, we are fortunate to have so many opportunities to shop locally. For example, the Coburg Farmers Market offers a great opportunity to support the local producers. Thank you. Finish, please. Sorry, Speaker. I know my constituents and people across the province are interested in what our government is doing to support local food. Speaker, could the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs please update this house on the government's local food strategy. Good. Thank you. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's great to have the positive voice of the member for Northumberland, Quiddy West, yeah. to return. Yeah. And I do know, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Northumberland, Quiddy West, is a fixture every week at the Coburg Farmers Market. I also know over the last couple of weeks that uh, the member's been spending a lot of time with his farmers as they combine both corn and soybeans. And buying locally, Mr. Speaker, we know it invigorates our local communities. We know that it keeps the dollars circulating locally. And you know, Mr. Speaker, the agri food sector in Ontario generates $34 billion of GDP, employs over 740,000 Ontarians each and every day. And we will continue. Our government, through the efforts of all of us here, to continue to support local farmers' markets and people looking, buying local food. Answer. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, on Friday, Domino's Pizza announced that 100% of their cheese will now be made Thank of 100% Canadian milk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. My constituents will be pleased to hear that our government's commitment to local food will remain strong as the local food mov movement is strong in my community. Minister, over the past few months, people have taken an interest in the part of the legislation that deals with farmers donating food to food banks. Mm -hmm. The tax credit for farmers was proclaimed on August 2nd. 
and I know the farmers and community food organizations are interested to know more details about this important amendment. Speaker, can the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs please provide more details on this tax credit? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I hope I provide a full answer so the member doesn't want a late show. As part of the Local Food Act, farmers would now be able to get a tax credit for donations of agricultural products to community food organization, the first of its kind of Canada. And I want to pay tribute this morning, Mr. Speaker, to the member from Sarnia Lambton, who brought forward, who brought forward the private member's bill and who joined with me at the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing in Hamilton a few short weeks ago to make this announcement. Mr. Speaker, not only will this tax credit benefit farmers who generously donated to provide healthier, nutritious local food for those that need it most, the tax credit moved forward because of this work this government has invested in stakeholders to develop this policy. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when we're in Hamilton, one of the local um, farmers is donating 1,000 pounds of hamburger to the local food bank in Hamilton to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, member from Simcoe North. Education. The minister, is my first question to you, so I hope you'll be kind to me in, in your response. Uh, but minister, uh, will you require school boards, including the Toronto District School Board, to post their uh, expenses trustees online? Their ex expenses of their trustees online. Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, certainly, if uh, if trustees and school boards wish to have a policy that requires them to post their uh, expenses online, we're quite. Uh, happy to support that. What the current state of the law is, is that uh, school boards are required to have an expense policy which complies with the broader public sector expense uh, policy. And uh, in the case of a Toronto District School Board, which is what brought all this up, uh, when the audit committee came to us and said, amongst other things, that they didn't have a policy and they were concerned about expenses, we yes, actually appointed a third party auditor to go in and look at them and directed them to come in line with that BPS directive Thank and you. create a policy. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, uh, I thought your government believed in transparency and accountability following a string of disasters like the power plant cancellations, Orange e Health, now Mars, the list was on and on. That was then this I think parents and taxpayers have the right to know the expenses their elected officials receive, including their trustees, especially when we know the funding shortfalls in areas such as student transportation and special needs. And the fact that we are going into debt in the province of Ontario at about a billion dollars a month right now. The media outlets like the Toronto Star should not have to pay tens of thousands of dollars for FOI requests. So when will this House be assured that all elected officials will have their expenses posted online? As I say, we're quite willing to look at that as an option in our accountability legislation and going forward, but right now, I have no legal authority to order that to happen. When a board has not used uh, the authority which it does has, has not complied with the law, then we have, then we have uh, directed them to come in line with the law. But quite frankly, I think this is why people all over over the province need to be thinking very carefully over the next week about trustee elections because the board is required to set a open and transparent policy that that complies with the uh, broader public service directive around expenses. Yes, sir. If their local board has not followed that direction, then they should be looking very carefully at the trustees that Thank they you. elect, because it's ultimately up Thank to the you. public. New question, the member from Melbourne, Manitoba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Premier. Premier, Justice Bel Paul Belanger's report on the Elliott Lake Mall collapse was detailed, conscientious, and included excellent advice for the government. But Justice Belanger also expressed deep frustration that a crucial government report 
on deteriorating, deteriorating parking structures will, was not disclosed to the Commission until long after the hearings and policy roundtables were over, even though some inquiry participants had helped prepare that report. Justice Belanger said that had he known of this government report, his mandate would have certainly have been affected. How is it possible that the government officials failed to disclose this document? Premier. Attorney General, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correction and I, we were in Elliott Lake last week when uh, Justice Belanger issued his, his report. And I would like to thank the Commissioner and his team for this very thorough study of the Algoma Center Mall tragedy. And I wanted to offer my deepest sympathy again to both family. It was uh, an, an unfortunate uh, uh, event that happened and I was there for the when this happened, and I was there for the funeral of one of the uh, of the victim, and I was there again with them receiving uh, with the with the population of uh, of Elliot Lake receiving the report. The the commissioner uh, has uh, had a very very important recommendation in his report, and. Uh, I, uh, I want to thank everyone who was involved with the Commissioner, Answer. all the individual and organization that contributed to his finding, finding and recommendation. Thank you very thank you. much, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the uh, Premier. Commissioner Belanger said there remains a big question his report is unable to answer. Why didn't the government implement the policy recommendations of this missing report? Justice Belanger wrote, if those reasons did in fact exist, they should have been made known to me, but they weren't, and this resulted in what he called missed opportunities. Will the government investigate and explain to Ontarians why this document was not disclosed to the inquiry process? Minister of Community Safety and Correction. Minister of Public Safety and Correction. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And uh, let me first uh, echo uh, my sympathies and condolences with the the Perizzolo and Alwyn family who lost their two loved ones in that uh, tragedy at Elliot Mark uh, uh, Lake two years ago. I want to thank uh, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin, uh, for his hard work on. Uh, along with this community on this important issue as well, and was he was present when the Attorney General and I uh, were um, in Elliot Lake last week to receive the report uh, from the Commissioner. And uh, while we were there, Speaker, uh, we assured the community that we will be uh, engaging in, in a very thorough uh, analysis uh, of the report, the work that uh, Mr. Uh, Justice Belanger has, has done and has undertaken to get back to community in about yes, a year's sir. time, as he, as he has advised us uh, with specific steps as to how we will implement Thank his you. recommendations. Thank you, Speaker. Very good. New question. New question. The member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our government has demonstrated its commitment to invest in people so that everyone has an opportunity to succeed and fully participate in the economy. I know that this House is keen to hear how this government will continue to help Aboriginal populations across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, there are over 9,000 entrepreneurs in Ontario that identify as Aboriginal. While there is positive growth for Aboriginal businesses and entrepreneurs in Ontario, we know that Aboriginal businesses and communities also face challenges. This includes difficulty in accessing capital and a lack of community-level capacity to leverage economic development opportunities. 
Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, as a former business owner, I am most interested to know what is our government going to do to ensure Question. that Aboriginal people can get support for business, employment and training opportunities? Thank you. Mr. Of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. I want to thank the member for Kingston and the Islands for that question. My ministry and our government has been working across government with all our Aboriginal partners to truly advance Aboriginal economic development. There are many things that an entrepreneur needs to think about, research and undertake before starting a business. Earlier this month, I announced the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund is now open for business. It is a three-year, $25 million initiative. The important part of the plan is to provide jobs and, uh, and prosperity fund and our overall plan of working to improve the socio-economic outcomes for Aboriginal people. Through the three funding streams, the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund will help Aboriginal businesses, communities and organizations create, diversify and collaborate in their business activities. Answer. I can tell this House that improving the socio-economic outcomes for Aboriginal peoples is an important part of our government's economic plan. It's an investment in the future prosperity of Aboriginal Thank you. I stand, you sit. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Constituents in my riding will be very interested to hear about the opportunities we are creating for Aboriginal people. I'm very glad to see that the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs is continuing its work on economic development for Aboriginal communities. It is vital for communities to engage and collaborate with each other, and that, that is what the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund is promoting. The fund is not only providing support to expand Aboriginal businesses, but it is also continuing to invest in new development projects. Mr. Speaker, can the minister provide additional information to the House about the three different funding streams and how the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund Question. will assist Aboriginal communities reach their full potential? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. The elements of the fund consist of creation, diversification and collaboration. The first funding stream, the Business Community Fund, will help create economic opportunities by financing projects that will expand economic capacity in individual Aboriginal communities. The second funding stream, the Economic Diversification Grants, will help Aboriginal communities identify new high potential op uh, opportunities in emerging sec sectors. And lastly, the third funding stream, the Regional Partnership Grants, will help focus on helping communities collaborate to create skills training and employment opportunities across the various regions of Ontario. I look forward to working in partnership with Aboriginal communities through this development fund. As I said earlier, Answer. together we can help develop Aboriginal communities to help construct and to add to the infrastructure and the business opportunities of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Thomas Fulton. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister of the Secrets Out, your government's been asleep at the wheel for more than a decade while lax standards for trucking licensing have jeopardized the safety of Ontario motorists. That's right. Make no mistake, allowing unregulated trucking schools to turn out unprepared truckers is a clear threat to public safety on Ontario roads, and it's your responsibility to act when the safety is compromised. Recently, a Toronto Star report revealed four unregulated schools identified for enforcement action still being allowed to operate, and you've done nothing to stop them. Why would anybody believe you will finally get leader. this right after years of your government spinning its wheels? Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, member opposite for that question. Of course, I am aware of the Toronto Star story or stories on this particular topic. The member opposite will know that here in Ontario, thanks to many years of hard work on the part of not only this government, but specifically the Ministry of Transportation and all of our road user safety partners, Speaker, that Ontario enjoys having amongst the safest roads in all of North America. 
And the member opposite would also know, I suspect, Speaker, if he'd read to the end of all of the stories, that I had the opportunity to speak to the Toronto Star and make it very clear that our government accepts nothing less than the very best in terms of road user safety for the people of Ontario. And that's why I've undertaken to work very closely with the Minister of Training and Colleges, Universities, and with industry representatives to make sure that we can come up with a system that allows us to have mandatory entry level Answer. training for truck drivers in the province of Ontario. Thanks very much, Mr. Good Speaker. Uh, Minister, we need action now. Your dithering and delay only further damages the reputation of reputable schools and drivers while continuing to compromise our safety. The Star report indicated that further to the incompetency of allowing unregulated schools to turn out untrained drivers, some of your own test centres are not even testing properly. It found during a dozen road tests at your Woodbridge Centre not one learner was taken on a 400 series expressway, this despite a ministry policy requiring them to do so. Minister, do you agree with your test centers issuing truckers licenses without ever taking them on the highway? Question. Thank you. Minister. Th thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important to note, uh, um, as I said in my, uh, in my opening answer about the fact that Ontario continues to have amongst the safest roads in all of North America, Speaker, I think it's, in, it's important to note that, uh, that we introduced a training standard for Class AZ drivers license training programs back in 2010, Speaker. And since that time, and this is where the facts take over this part of the story, Speaker, since that time, we have seen the number of fatal conditions involving large trucks on Ontario's roads has reached an, an, a five-year low. Speaker, having said that, we know that more work is required to be done. It's why Ministry of Transportation officials will continue to monitor and audit all of our truck driving uh, testing centres, and it's why I've also undertaken to work closely with the Ontario Trucking Association, with the Ministry and Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, so that we can work towards implementing a mandatory training program yes, for truck drivers in Ontario. Thanks, Speaker. Any question? The member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for poverty reduction. Six years ago, the minister wrote, and I quote, poverty is a problem we cannot afford. She said the time for action is now, end quote. And she set what was called an achievable target to reduce child poverty by 25 percent in five years, a target New Democrats and any poverty, poverty people strongly, strongly supported. Clear targets and timelines are the only way to hold the government accountable for promises they make to the most vulnerable. Her new poverty reduction strategy has no timelines to cut child poverty, no target for reducing uh, homelessness. Why does the minister have no idea when or even if this government will deliver on its promises once again? Speaker, thank you for the question because it does give me an opportunity to talk about a very, very important initiative that is core to our values as a government, and that is the reduction of poverty. Speaker, we did release our poverty reduction, our first poverty reduction strategy, which did set a very ambitious goal of reducing child poverty. If you actually look at that report, and I urge you to read it, you will see we laid out the conditions under which we could have achieved 25 per cent reduction in five years. We were very clear about what the province could and should do, and we have done all of the things we said we would do. The federal government, however, did not step up the way they would have had to if we were to achieve that goal. We continue to call on the federal government to Answer. make reducing child poverty a, a priority for them, Speaker, because we are all better off when the least of us are better off. So, Speaker, I would thank, uh, uh, thank the member opposite for the interest and uh, continue to work to reduce child poverty. There will be no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.